Gamchi Lakwan, live and direct from Knight Library at the University of Warwick, and this is Diversa TV, uh, broadcast on Lane TV's channel. I'm your host, Mark Harris. If you are new to Diversa TV, welcome. Diversa TV is a weekly interview show talking about issues around the rubric of diversity. Uh, if you are a part of our growing legion of fans, welcome back. Uh, I greeted you in the language, uh, probably a bad accent because I have a um, California newscaster English accent. Uh, so it probably wasn't grammatically correct, Yankala Kalapuya, but it's basically, what's up? Diversa TV's mission, and we choose to accept it, is to illuminate everyday diversity issues and give the mic and the camera to those who don't always get it and to talk about issues that you don't necessarily see on false, oh, excuse me, Fox News and uh, other uh, television shows of the day. So we are attempting to be somewhat educational, being on uh, educational cable, and one of the things we're looking at uh, this season, our seasons roughly correspond to LCC terms. We are in season 13 second show of season, season 13. So we've been going for nearly five years. I uh, have a little over 80 shows in the can. And uh, this season we're looking at systems and how people get in them. So one of the ways that we look at systems, I know that even though you can't necessarily read this, I'll just walk you through it. Your extreme, extreme screen left. This is Dr. Terry Cross from Portland State University's um, he basically has a cultural competency continuum for organizations. Now, the construct that he came up with in terms of looking at how institutional racism or other systems, systems of discrimination play out is it comes along a continuum. So, for example, extreme left, uh, cultural destructiveness. So it's the negative end of the continuum. There's active participation in the destruction of other cultures other than uh, what we, what R Alan Johnson would refer to as the matrix of domination or what Bell Hooks would refer to as white supremacist capitalist patriarchy. If you are not a wealthy white male then, and can't conform to that culture, then the culture attempts to destroy you overtly even by killing you. Cultural incapacity, which is a, which is a uh, second one over. Paternal posture towards groups in the minority ignorance of and unrealistic fear of people of color, lower expectations of culturally different clients. So this uh, is actually oriented towards social service or actually even education. Cultural blindness is the middle one, which is a color, cult, color or cultural makes no difference. Belief that the conventional approaches are universally applicable despite past history, ignores cultural strengths and blames culture and client for uh, problems within the system. Cultural pre-competence, uh, which attempts to, where the institution or organization attempts to improve some aspect of service and may believe that the accomplishment of one goal or activity that is, for example, hiring a staff member, having a dedicated staff member, writing a mission statement, fulfills the obligation to communities of color or cultural groups. Cultural competence uh, accepts and respects cultural diversity there's continuous self-assessment for knowledge and skill building and actively involves cultural groups in service delivery and education of the institution and allows use of culturally specific technology where it exists in the culture. And then cultural proficiency, which not only holds cultures in high esteem, assists others in developing cultural competence and advocates for cultural responsiveness throughout the systems. Now, it can be said that the default position for many mainstream institutions in America is cultural blindness. We've evolved away from uh, being overtly culturally destructive and uh, some institutions uh, begin to move towards a position where at least they give some uh, lip service to the rubric of diversity. But uh, we could be said they could be said to be you know, culturally pre-competent because they haven't entirely adopted uh, service delivery in terms of looking at who you hire, where they're placed, et cetera. And tonight's guest is going to help us begin to have that conversation. So Dr. Christine Clifford Cullinan has been a teacher, curriculum designer, and organizational consultant since 1972. 
Her work as a trainer, consultant, and training administrator for, uh, administrator for federal, state, and local government and educational institutions, as well as companies in the private sector, has taken her to more than 35 states and given her the opportunity to lead seminars and teach classes for faculty, administrators, students, and other professionals at many colleges and universities. And I actually edited down this extensive list, including Princeton, Michigan State, University of Hawaii, Seattle University, UC Davis, my alma mater, Sonoma State University, the OHSU, and many others. In the last 20 years, Dr. Cullinan has focused her academic and professional work on helping institutions, agencies, and other organizations build culturally competent leadership and recognize and remove barriers to equity stemming from the institutionalization of privilege. Her topics have included curriculum and training design for diversity issues, methods and strategies for adding socioeconomic class issues to work on diversity and social justice, practical methods and strategies for hiring cul for cultural, cultural competence and other 21st century skills. Two examples of her work, if you want to look for her on the net, uh, include Equity in Higher Education, the article Vision, Privilege, and the Limits of Tolerance, which appeared in the Spring 99 issue of Electronic Magazine of Multicultural Diversity, and also her essay Finding Racism Where You Least Expect It, which appeared in the Chronicle of Higher Education in May of 2002. Currently in press is the chapter in Internationalizing Postsecondary Ed, Opportunities, Possibilities, and Challenges authored with Carl James and Anna Cruceru. Please welcome our guest, Chris Cullinan. Hi, Mark. Good to see you. So um, I've never asked you this, <laughs> but it's a standard diversity TV question uh, on the assumption that you didn't come in on the pioneer wagon. Where are you from? Where were you born? Uh, OK, so my people come from Ireland by way of England. We were English nobility in Ireland and mm. from Poland. Mm. And so I was born in Buffalo, New York. Huh. Uh, and I think uh, to a certain extent, once a New Yorker, always a New Yorker, even if it's upstate. Uh, <laughs> so and I was the product of a marriage that neither family was happy about. The Polish relatives were actually wealthier than the English Irish relatives and the English relatives were just basically prejudice. Um, mm. Mm. So, uh, you know, but that's, that's where I spent the first nine years of my life is Buffalo. Mm. Okay. Yeah. How did you come to be interested and trained to do what you do today? Okay, well that'll take an hour and a half and then we won't have anything else to talk about. <laughs> uh, but coming from where you came from, okay. there is that journey. So. It's a long story, but it we moved, my father worked for NASA, we moved uh, f from Buffalo to Denver and then we ended up moving to uh, Slidell, Louisiana just outside of New Orleans in 1964. Wow, that would so have been we a were, cultural shock. Right? Yeah, we were white Yankees the year they passed the Civil Rights Act. Oh, um, okay. And so <laughs> I walked into a culture where there were still in fact, I clearly remember this. One of my first memories is uh, is uh, men's, women, and colored bathrooms. Mm. Uh, and then the next year, they desegregated the schools with the passage of the '64 Civil Rights Act. Yeah. So, it was the three years that I spent down there going to high school was my opportunity to end up understanding a little bit about what it meant to open your mouth and immediately have a problem. Mm. But if I kept my mouth shut. I had skin privilege, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and my parents were uh, vehemently anti-racist, and so if you came home at the end of the day and talked about stuff that had gone on in school and you hadn't done anything about it, they wanted to know why, uh, you know, what, where had they gone wrong if you hadn't stood up or spoken up. Uh, so Your parents gave you civil rights home training? Uh, they wouldn't have called it that. They would have just said it was the right thing to do. Yeah. But yeah. I think my father came out of World War II with a very strong sense of what happens. He was in uh, Europe, in the mm. European theater, right. okay. when racism is allowed and, and ethnic and racial and religious hatred is allowed to run things. And it's just the way they were both raised. And it may have had a lot to do with just the courage they had to get married. Yeah. So. 
and even being technically both white, so to speak. Oh yeah, but from oh, absolutely. Different, ethnic the groups, different yeah. classes. Yeah, and different and classes. Different, at that time in the 30s and 40s, different ethnic backgrounds mm. among the white mm. folks. So how'd you come to Oregon? Uh, my partner, Michael, and I worked for the federal government uh, in training and development across a bunch of states and discovered that the contractor who had the federal contract was acting unethically and uh, quit the positions that we had and there was another regional center for doing the contract out uh, in California. We called them, they said, you move out to the West Coast, we can use you. And so there were already uh, people that we knew in Oregon and so we moved to Eugene. Mm. Okay. Long story, yeah. very short. Right, well, you know, in the interest of full disclosure, I mean, we met in, I mean, you, I, well, you gave me my start in training in the alcohol and drug system in way the back. state. Way back. Way back. Right? Now, um, as I was explaining to our student government, who had a little uh, diversity issue uh, recently, um, the addictions field stopped being simply alcohol and drug probably in the late 70s, early yeah. 80s, and we were starting to look at other dr drugs besi besides addiction mm -hmm. and looking into what we now call diversity issues. But right. that wasn't, then it was a code word for race, but now it has been expanded to other things beyond that. So part of the, some of the resistance we get to even terms like cultural competency, or, well, I know not to say the N-word. Well, no, it's not about that. Right. Do you know how to deal with TBI issues with vets? What? Who? Oh, I'm not speaking. Speak English. Well, that was English. Well, also, when we started working together, you were part of the cross-cultural task force to look at training across the state. Yeah. And that was part of what we were beginning to recognize is by ignoring those issues of difference, we weren't competently serving the clients. So. Yes. Yeah. Yes, right. I mean, yeah. beyond the, the issues of ethnicity and class, yeah. uh, junkies are different than alcoholics. Yes. Poly addicts are different than, you know, when we have to stay exactly. a, ahead of the game, at least understanding what's going on pharmacologically to the degree that we can, and then expanding that knowledge. So yeah. I had a lot of fun not being a 12-stepper, but being into the science and trying to figure out, oh, what is the neuroscience behind mm -hmm. this? This is fun. Mm -hmm. but, so in training, you've identified it as yourself as a person with or, uh, or of privilege, and you kind of indicated that within uh, your intro. Uh, for example, <clears throat> yeah, you, you've advocated for people without privilege. So for example, like when we met, and you're talking about you know, when the A&D field first started looking at HIV infections and then sexually transmitted diseases and let's get beyond the stigma. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you were an advocate, you know, as you were saying, if I may quote you, uh, a heterosexual woman, you know, from a privileged background and mm -hmm. why would I, you know, advocate, you know, for homosexuals of any description mm -hmm. without being a quote unquote the pejorative fag hag kind of thing. No, mm -hmm. can we get beyond that? Mm -hmm. Look at this is a medical condition. This is a group that's organizing for its own uh, interest and the, by the way, the interest of all of us because mm -hmm. our perception that this is a gay disease mm -hmm. is flat out wrong from mm -hmm. the science. Right. And then what happens when people are denied access? Because right. it's an access issue. Can you talk about that some? That privilege piece, how do people get to see that? Well, I think one of the things, since we're talking about cultural competency, part of the issue with cultural competency is do I understand that there are questions and complexities here in dealing with whether we're talking about the student in the classroom or the client in the clinic? Uh, do I understand that some of the assumptions I might naturally ba make based on my programming may not only be wrong, but may be hurtful or dangerous, uh, may impede learning, may impede healing, may impede recovery. Uh, and I think part of what's important to realize when you're privileged, uh, so and when I talk about being privileged, I'm talking about being heterosexual, being married, being uh, upper middle class by most standards, by being having a PhD, you can't go a whole lot further. Um, I do, I'm going back for my 40th, 
college reunion and discovering some of the people coming back have PhDs and MDs, so they've really overdone <laughs> it. But, you know, along the, you know, being raised Catholic, um, which means I have a Christian background, all of those pieces go to the kinds of things I could ignore if I weren't paying attention to not only difference, but why, why and how difference makes a difference in how people learn and how people heal and how people approach things. And so I think that, you know, in, a, in an interesting and ironic way, it is very frequently those of us with privilege that have the opportunity to get into those positions to affect other people's health, to affect other people's learning, and who help run the systems to hire other people. And therefore, it is, it's critical if we're going to do an ethical job, that we become aware of the questions that need to be asked, of the kinds of issues that need to be explored, so that we really can be talking about effective teaching or effective treatment, effective uh, medical care, effective child care, whatever the issue is. Hmm. There are multiple ironies. So, so for example, we're in um, our two institutions, Lane and the university, um, we often hire each other's folks. I, I, know, I know that Lane hires a lot of part-timers and mm -hmm. for our part-time pool who eventually become full-time. I know in one of the... The new head of our student government, by the way, <laughs> is a transfer student from Lane. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes, so... So um, it's, uh, I don't, dare I say it's incestuous or, or whatever, in a lot of, or intermixed, interdependent, better. probably a better yeah. word. Um, one of the things you talked about is kind of like the hidden history of uh, the university system where we're like monks. We're mm. like the church. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, you know, we, we have our canon, we have our rituals, we have our ceremonies. And then all of a sudden, there's this cor corporate culture being imposed to have us look at kind of like diversity issues mm -hmm. and hiring ethically and hiring diversely. And there's a cultural class. Can you talk about that somewhat? Well, I would I would back that up just a little bit. I'm I have people who know me know I'm fond of saying the university is a monastery and a business that run a school together, right? Yes. And. Um, and, th and that's because uh, people who are academic faculty, those, those of us that go far enough to get the doctorate and actually want to do research and do writing, and that's what we're really focused on, in a way, those are our belief systems that we are interested in not only honing but getting closer to, understanding more deeply, and in finding acolytes that will continue that work. Yes, and so right. it's, you know, it's a right. monastery model in some, in some of the best senses of the word. But there's also the entire business side of the university that, and people who join the business side understand it as a business. This is where that whole debate comes in is are, are students students, are they customers, you know, that mm -hmm. confusion uh, can get cleared up if we just start talking about how we're serving students and what we're doing. So one of the issues that comes into this is the different approaches to how you would handle difference in those two models, right? And I think you're right. Corporately, if you look at the corporate models across the country, either they're going, well, for our, our survival and our well-being, uh, we need to do a better job being culturally competent. Mm -hmm. Or in order to stop the lawsuits, we need to mm -hmm. do a better job right. of being culturally right. competent. I think very often, both at Lane and at the University of Oregon, at higher ed in, in general, we struggle sometimes to get beyond well, it's a school, so people just go through school and they either make it or they don't, and we do our better level best job teaching without looking at what our students bring into the room with them and how do we work with that? How do we make every student feel like we see them and, and they're important? And that's part of the cultural competency that goes into teaching and curriculum development. Um, the reason why uh, you alluded earlier to the article that uh, Dr. Carl James and I have put together. So Carl James is a sociologist out of York University in Toronto, and he has his own center for uh, education and community looking at how the K-12 system affects the uh, students' success, 
both in K-12 and at university level. That is his focus. We are both fascinated by the fact that universities have dealt with multiculturalism now for, what, two decades? Easy. And now we're going to internationalize. Right. Are we going to do that as well as we did multiculturalism, which is not very well? Uh, and are we, why are we not looking at this? And I think the university and Lane are both trying to do this. Look at this in terms of what are these students bringing to us? What are staff and faculty bringing to us? And how do we make sure that we are weaving that into the entire fabric? And, and when we start asking questions like that, I think we're approaching it in a more culturally competent way. Hmm. Do you want to go to the graphic? Would sure. that be helpful at sure, this we point? we could go to the graphic. Okay, don't switch yet, guys. But, let's see. All right, now. So, um, this is something that actually came from ideas in uh, one of Carl James' most recent books, and I put it into a graphic in order to try to capture it. The idea being that cultural identity has a lot to do with a whole huge number of forces, including sexual orientation, social class, ethnicity, race, color, immigration status, uh, minority issues, education and career issues, regional issues that are affecting people all the time. All the time yeah. But they're not affecting the same people in the same ways. No, right. And the, the thing about identity is it's always moving. It is never a, a fixed target. And whatever it is that I'm focusing on today, you know, maybe I have a good friend who is not documented and something was in the newspaper today about immigration and new more restrictive immigration issues. That's on my mind today because of my friend. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm thinking about when I walk into class and somebody makes some remark about illegals uh, mm -hmm. in the state. And that's suddenly what I'm focused on. I may not be focusing on my race, my ethnicity, my gender, my anything else right then. Uh, I also have the voices in my head, the people that raised me and the communities that raised me that are telling me all the time, what should I be paying attention to? What's important here? What do I need to speak up about? So everybody has those kinds of influences in the way that they see and experience things every day. But when we experience another person, those outside arrows that are, uh, that are dotted are the only things we actually know about somebody else. So the only, yeah, the things that they show, for example, yeah. yeah, like you say, word choices, and body language, body language, and stated values, yeah. and those things are all we have to go on. Hmm. Cultural competency is in part understanding that those are the only things we have to go on; that we don't know the rest of it, hmm. and not making the assumption of grabbing one of those pieces and thinking that we understand the rest from that one. So I could, never having met you, I could say, oh, dreads, huh? Well, he's obviously one of those radical, well, it's Eugene, radical hippie types. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, that probably means he believes this or he believes that. So when I talk to him, I better be careful not to bring up this or not to bring up that. Yes, or, right. or maybe I need to consult him on, you know, Mark, uh, what do you th how do you think African Americans feel about the new census data on Latinos? Uh, because, hey, you're African American, you must have a racial pitch on this. <laughs> and I, I don't think that people do that in order to, you know, jump to conclusions. But I think when they, when they don't think about the complexity that's going on for individuals, when they don't think about the questions, when they don't think about what those statements say in terms of the assumptions that we're making, then that's, that's where cultural competency can really be improved. Mm. Well, as an example, I mean, if we're going to, even though I have trained myself to not think it's all about me, right. you know, using that specific example. So, yeah, when I think about the illegal immigration issue, you know, when I talked about it in class, it's like, okay, how do light-skinned Cubans get a pass? So, right. for, for example, um, in, in the South, they would refer to it as passing the paper bag test. I cannot. Right. I'm darker than a brown paper bag. Right. right. So, in Latin America, there are 130 million black people. 
Right. So more black people in Latin America than there are in America, which means that if you're a dark-skinned Cuban, you're a boat person, and you come over and you land in Florida, you're an illegal immigrant, but if you're light-skinned Cuban, you get to stay. But if you're a dark-skinned Cuban, person from the same country, you're sent back as if you're a Haitian. Well, and, and then there's the question of why the Haitian immigration policy is different from the Cuban immigration yes, policy. Right. Right. I have a, a friend in San Francisco who is Afro-Cuban, and her entire family, except for herself, are very light-skinned and, uh, in fact, fairly conservative. It is partially through her that I started to read more and learn more about the complexity. But that's a good example. You have, you can go to Florida and notice that you will be greeted in Spanish before you're greeted in English. Right. Now, right. if you don't, in some parts of Florida, yes. if you don't speak Spanish, you may not understand at all the different kinds of Spanish that mm -hmm. are going that on. Around you, yeah. If you uh, are just suddenly struck with Spanish language, what will occur to you is, gee, there's a lot of Spanish-speaking people. The politics and the, con and the complexities of Cuban immigration, Haitian immigration, immigration in Florida from Mexico, immigration from other parts of Latin America, all Spanish-speaking, except for the Haitians, uh, you won't understand any of that unless you have done some reading or you've been lucky enough to have somebody pointed out to you. Or chosen to expose yourself, which is another piece. So if you teach at the University of Central Florida, where my good friend Valerie King is an assistant VP, you need to understand the complexities of those issues if you're going to be effective with students. Mm -hmm because you're going to have that kind of complexity right in your classroom mm -hmm. every day. Every day. Uh, right. And making assumptions of dividing people into primarily English speakers, primarily Spanish speakers, is going to get you nowhere. Uh, <laughs> and, and you're going to make some major mistakes in terms of your assumptions. Uh, so I, that's a good example, actually, of you know, teaching at that university. You need to understand a huge amount about not just the relationships between immigration, the United States, the politics among the Spanish speakers in the area, but you're also going to have Jewish students because there's a large Jewish population. You're going to have uh, students that, um, I think there are 55,000 students now at the University of Central Florida. It's in Orlando. Everybody wants to come to Orlando for a variety of strange reasons. So you're also going to have white students who may or may not understand this complexity. Some of them will, some of them don't. And you're going to take a classroom of students and you're going to get the best learning possible going by helping them learn and teach each other as well as you teaching them. Yeah. And that's where cultural competency can be incredibly helpful. You know, because otherwise, a lot of the deep, rich, complexity in the room is going to be invisible to you and odds are you will say or do things that lead people to make the assumption that you don't care right or or worse right because and I guess what could be worse I mean I guess it's a matter of point of view so from yeah. my point of view um, talking with student government as right. an example and relating an experience about Okay, I'm talking to the Board of Education at Lane Community College a little over a decade ago, and I'm saying, look, I'm from Los Angeles, so I, ha I speak California newscaster English. So that means English without an accent. Ha, ha, ha. Right? But I'm dealing with a particular department where they think that hiring diverse means hiring white people from Montana, Wyoming, and Idaho instead of Oregon. Ah. And who in a hiring process, you're, you're gonna love this being from Buffalo, made a comment about a white woman whose accent was hard to understand and it was from New York. And it was a slight Brooklyn accent. Mm -hmm. 
and they were wondering whether they should hire because students might have trouble with their accent. Mm -hmm. So I used that example to say, look, I'm from Los Angeles. I have to understand 16 different types of English and that's just American white people mm -hmm. and correctly understand it. So mm -hmm. then when you get to determining Filipino accent, you know, Taiwan versus Mandarin, <laughs> you know, mainland China versus Taiwan mm -hmm. versus uh, India from, you know, Bangalore or M Mumbai or mm -hmm. whatever, that complexity, you know, and it's a physicist and they're, you know, noted in their field, I better be listening to them. Because, you know, when I heard from student government, well, this one, you know, I like this professor, but she's from Chinese, she's Chinese, her accent is hard to understand. Okay, but <laughs> she's got a PhD from a university bigger than Oregon, so mm -hmm. like Harvard. So I guess they didn't have a problem with it. So if you do, you should understand the world is hiring on not because of your competency in Marcola, well, and, Put and, your competency in Beijing. You know, and I think that's a great e example of another area that uh, where we could we could learn a lot in terms of cultural competency. So uh, many of us in the United States, our handicap was speaking only one language, mm. and it's not so much that you need to speak a second language, but just trying to learn another language will tell you a lot about accents. So whatever your primary language is, unless you're lucky enough to grow up, actually grow up speaking to, but whatever your primary language is, the, the sounds from that language will transfer into your second language. That's why people can study French for years, go to Paris, and immediately people go, oh, you're from the United States, right? Mm -hmm. it's, because it's the United States, right. you know, it's English, United States English, pronunciations woven into French. Mm. So if people understood that from the beginning, if, if it was clear to people that whatever your second or third or fourth language is, your first language is going to influence how you pronounce that. And that those things are going to impact not only how you hear another language, but very often even if you can hear another language. So when you're, when you're talking about accented English and you're listening to somebody who maybe their first language is Japanese and so they're speaking English on a flat tone because Japanese is spoken on a flat tone and only the questions go up. Mm. Uh, so I've been watching interviews with people in Japan around the, the tsunami and the earthquake and you'll hear somebody say they're Japanese and it's just rapid fire. Well, part of that is it's, it's not tonal, and so mm -hmm. it sounds even faster than it is. Well, if you're then learning English, your English, at least initially, is going to be on a flat tone. English is a, a language that goes up and down, and so yeah, yeah. you're listening to somebody speak English in a flat tone, and they sound like they're bored, or they sound like they're not interested, because we don't understand that issue of tonal tonality. And you brought up Chinese. Chinese <laughs> has even more um, interesting uh, tonal qualities, and tonal quality is incredibly important to what a word even means. Mm -hmm. So when a primary Chinese speaker will learn ling English, they add tonal qualities to English. And we make that sometimes fun. That weren't in English fun. to begin with. Yeah, yeah. and we make yeah. fun, right? right? It's like, right. well, that's sing song. Yeah, right. Well, no, it's the Chinese tonal quality going yeah. into English. If you know that, if you understand that about tonal qualities in language, then you look at understanding someone speaking an accent with an accent as understanding how the tonal qualities are translating. And it becomes an interesting problem, but also something that you know goes on whenever there are two or three languages. I mean, I, I don't think you need to understand a lot about each individual language if it occurs to you this person speaks another first language and so I need to get cued into the tonal qualities that they're using for English. Yeah. That, you know, that's not an impossible thing to do. We do tend to, I think for those of us that are monolinguists, we can be, have very lazy ears, not used to, to doing that. Yeah. And but you can learn to do that. Right. I yeah. tried to convey about, okay, listen harder, but, you know, without yeah. going into a whole lecture on it. Yeah. You know, so when we 
so this is all still a very elementary level. This is like learning basic arithmetic and adding, you know, a couple of three-digit numbers together. You yeah, know, but if nobody told you arithmetic exists. That's right. Yeah. Then that would be difficult. But so if we were talking about hiring. Yeah. Okay. And we look at, uh, say, decision points within the hiring process. Um, now, even whether, you know, because one of the experiences that I had, you know, personally at LCC is they, you know, when I got hired, um, they said I was overqualified, and so why would, it, okay, why is that relevant? Mm -hmm. And, oh, you're taking an $8,000 cut and pay. Well, look, the super, you know, superintendent that's replacing George is taking an $8,000 cut and pay and starting at George's ending salary. Right. Uh, is this relevant? <laughs> right. And he's, he knows that you have budgetary problems. And okay, maybe they like the challenge. Maybe people like the challenge. I mean, for me, that was also part of it. Besides being with the kids mm -hmm. every day on a daily basis, you mm -hmm. know, small children, the challenge of having to rebuild a program from scratch, from, from shambles. Mm -hmm. And so maybe overqualifications is actually good. But to ask that question or to make that statement to a candidate is questionable, if mm -hmm. not illegal. Yeah. Well, and I, and I think it's, uh, making the statement or not, it's kind of a silly assumption. Um, you have a position that you're putting out there, and we haven't even talked about the fact that no matter what the position is anywhere in your institution, my institution, we should be looking at what are the issues of difference that this position is going to be dealing right. with, and how yes. do we build that in. Yes. We are, we're putting the position out there, we're asking people to apply. If we were advertising for a physicist uh, at the university and we were to get a Nobel Prize winner that wanted to work here, we wouldn't say, oh, you're overqualified. No. You know, right. We would just be grateful right. that somebody with uh, that sort of prestige, that possibly research background, um, would be interested, right? We, y you can, I, I think the, the common things that I hear are, well, the person won't stay. Well, somebody could promise, you know, we could ask them all to, to sign an affidavit, I will stay for five years, right? Mm -hmm. And next week my aged mother gets ill and I have to transfer back to Minnesota to take care of right. her. Uh, nobody can guarantee that. But I think in terms of cultural competency, our job once we hire someone, and we're going to hire the best person for the job, is to make them welcome to use them to the fullest, to make sure that we're interested in everything they could bring to the university or to the college so that they stay. Yes, you know, right. That everything that we can control are things that would encourage them to stay. Yes. Not, not while they're putting up with it, <laughs> uh, because they have to, or you know, I've I've talked to over the years at a lot of institutions, dozens and dozens and dozens of people who say, you know, I could do so much more here, but I'm staying because of X. Mm -hmm. But I can't do this. I can't do that. I'm not allowed to do this. And and the real unfortunate thing is that I don't think it's it's the intent. I don't think anybody says, well. I'm hiring Mark Harris, but I'm only going to use 10% of what he knows how to do. I think a lot of times it's I'm hiring Mark Harris and hit the ground running, Mark, and, but we don't take the time to say, let's talk about all the things that you could bring to this and, and so that we're mu much more likely to keep you. Yeah. And we keep faculty sometimes by saying, you want your own institute? We'll see <laughs> if we can get it funded. <laughs> because if that's what it's going to take to keep you, right? Uh, or you have this particular area that you'd really, really like to do research. If we want to keep you, we'll try to find a way to make that happen. You know, it, we should be hiring every person with an eye toward their bringing very specific talents and skills and knowledge. How do we make full use of those? Yeah. Yeah. Right. And do we do, are we capable of using making full use of those? Well, and I think that that's part of the that's part of what we always have to ask ourselves. Uh, I don't believe that 
again, that it's usually the intent of institutions to underuse, utilize people. But I think, uh, I'll just give you one example of, you know, any institution in the country that uh, might say, well, we're going to hire Mark to work on something with regard to diversity. Um, we're not going to hire you to do something with regard to psychology or organizational structure or anything else. Uh, and you are more likely to get the diversity job because you look diverse. Diverse, right. right. Yeah, right. Um, so we have people that come to the university uh, and to Lane Community College and to Princeton and to other places who bring a lot that they could uh, weave into the fabric of how the institution does business but they're seen more narrowly. Instead of seeing the complexity of that identity chart, we see one or two things, and that's where we want to funnel them. And sometimes it's because you might have a particular set of skills and knowledge that we see we don't, the rest of us don't have, so we'll put you there. Right. But that goes back to the question of why aren't we hiring for cultural competency in every single position? And what does that mean, and how is that different in every single position? Right. Because, exactly. right, I mean, I got placed in the diversity, you know, rubric because I'm black, but I got into the diversity rubric because of the issues of doing my particular job in A&D. Mm -hmm. Because the feds basically said, look, okay, you want a more recovery-friendly environment, then a, a diverse environment is more recovery-friendly. Right. Because then they can understand the differences of how job stress makes you want to drink or you know, do the things that <laughs> were happening every day. Mm -hmm. You know, people coming drunk to work or <gasps> in a medical marijuana state, stoned mm -hmm. or, you know, strung out on prescription drugs or doing combinations or, wow, mm -hmm. let's, we need, we need Adderall to, as study aids or right. <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. I mean, how it's evolved and then, you know, all the different, tr so understanding those drug trends it's so like, okay, if I start with trying to bring in more folks, they can understand some of the complexities, how that's playing out here. Start asking questions. I, this is one of the things that if you, if you look up cultural competency on the Internet, you'll get a lot of hits from the healthcare system. Yes. Not just from A&D, but the healthcare system right. in general. Right. Because what the healthcare system has started to realize, particularly hospitals and doctors, but particularly hospitals, is if they don't do a good job serving the needs of people who represent communities that they haven't historically done a very good job with, the word goes out. Yeah. You know, yeah. You, you can't go there or they don't understand or, you know, when I tried to bring or more than three with people their treatment into, dollars or whatever, yeah. yeah. Well, just look at what's happening with what's happened with visiting rooms. Mm. Visiting rooms have gotten bigger, there are more of them because of the recognition that many people want to bring their families and, and many cultures would say that it would simply be unacceptable to have a family member in the hospital and not have several generations there uh, to at least wait, wait to talk to the person. Understanding that you might not be able to have everybody in the room, right. yeah. but there's a place for them to be and a place for them to talk to each other. Um, you know, the healthcare system gradually is coming to terms with that. When we bring students to campus that have so much that they could be adding to classroom discussion, when we bring faculty and staff to campus that have so much that they could be adding to how we do business, including criticizing, including critiquing, yeah. including saying, wait a minute, why isn't this happening if this is, or why can't we do this? I think that all of the, the quote-unquote diversity plans and diversity work that the institutions are trying to do is aimed at trying to open that up, but we're clumsy at it because we're not very good at it, and so we take shortcuts. We don't want to look at the full complexity. What are some of the shortcuts we take? I think one of the shortcuts that we take is by, again, only looking at a person through one of their lenses. Mm. You know. Um, you know, you seem to understand something based on race, so what would you suggest there? As opposed to, let's look at the complexities of how race and class 
and ethnicity and skin color play out when we have students on campus uh, that don't look predominantly white and dominant culture. How does class play out at the University of Oregon? How does class play out at Lane? Uh, the recent study where they showed that student affairs work at community colleges is not really very relevant for people that are 25 and older. But, and so many of your students are older students. Right. So right. what's the model that community colleges have to evolve? Do they continue to put such a huge emphasis on student affairs? Or do they look at how older students need support in the classroom? And yes, so do right. we now... For learning because they've returned right. after a hiatus. And right. they don't have time to spend on campus right. hanging out. Right. So are we starting to look at our faculty in community colleges, and Lane isn't the only community college I work with, where we say to ourselves, what sorts of qualities, knowledge, understandings are we looking for here? So that faculty understand that those connections in the classroom are even more important than they've ever been before. Yeah. Um, you know, we have, um, I believe, right around 40% of our international students at the University of Oregon are from China now. 20 years ago, at least as far as I recall, we had no Chinese international students, partially because China didn't really allow their students to travel. Well, we have this opportunity to become, as a university, much more aware of how coming from different areas of China, let's look at the complexities of China, let's look at the differences among areas, let's look at the, the many, many different languages, you know, versions of Chinese. What does it mean to be Chinese from Taiwan, Chinese from Hong Kong, uh, Chinese from the mainland? Uh, how do all these things figure into what these students experience every day on campus? This is our opportunity to not only learn from our students, and I'm not talking about lining our students up and saying, tell us what we need to know, but how do we Focus do... Focus groups, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, right, yeah. yeah. Well, we can pay them a stipend for teaching us extra. Right, um, right. Uh, but how do we uh, take advantage of the fact that we have this opportunity uh, to study this area and to learn more about it and to do workshops and training on it and to bring in speakers that might help us. Uh, this is an opportunity. Those are the kinds of things that, and, and no matter where you are, whether you work in the residence halls or suppose you work in campus ops and you run into students uh, while you're doing the grounds or cleaning the rooms, or you work in the kitchens, or you work in the admissions office, or you work in the registrar's office, or any of those places, you're going to run into our international students. How well do we understand who we have on campus? Uh, and, I, and I fear that we're not, that we're taking, and I'm not talking about the University of Oregon necessarily, but all campuses need to look at how well they've handled issues of multiculturalism, how often they code multiculturalism to just mean skin color. Yes, right. And how some of those same issues of oversimplification and stereotyping also play in when we bring students from other countries and other cultures. So. And it's often one of the, the, the points of resistance that we get, uh, especially even using the word cultural competence and say, Okay, we're going to mandate cultural competency training. Oh well, I don't want to be, you know, forced to, into a political correctness. Okay, it's not about political correctness. We're, cultural competence isn't about race. It's also about looking at how are you going to serve not only those international students, but returning vets, right? The older students, right? Uh, the students that are homeless, the you know, et cetera. There are levels of complexity that are just as complex as race. That okay, you're you're not saying that you're going to discriminate discriminate against our servicemen and women coming back to get retrained, are you? Oh well, no, no, no. Okay, that's what cultural competence means. Well, and you know, again, back to oversimplifying. Uh, I think that we have not, we in the so-called 
you know, social justice, multiculturalism, diversity, community, whatever you want to call it, those of us that are trying to affect systems. I don't think we've done a terrific job ourselves because we've oversimplified it. We've done things like, say, I want to see certain colors of people. Well, if we'd started with, I want to see certain competencies in everyone we hire. Now, it's not going to be a huge surprise that some of the people that are out there that really think cultural competency is important and constantly work on it in their own work and in their own professions happen to be people that aren't dominant culture. Hmm. Right? But, you know, there are also people that have a lot of dominant culture privilege that also work on it. Yeah. What I would love to see is if our advertisements and our position descriptions made it so clear that we're looking for all the skills that are necessary to do this job well with everybody, that people who really think that, that continuing to develop their skills in these areas are important, that that's an important thing, would look at this job description and say, this is great, this is a job I want to apply for, this is a job I'm excited about, this is a job that makes the University of Oregon or Lane Community College pop out from all the other positions that I've looked at. But I'd also like to see the people who don't think that paying attention to difference and understanding the complexity and understanding the complexity of, of those identity issues, those people that don't think that's important, I'd like them to look at our job descriptions and say, hey, I don't want to work there because look at the attention right. they're paying to this. Right. Or maybe not initially, but then I look at the supplemental questions that I'm supposed to answer, and I see that it's woven into that. I see that it's woven into minimum qualifications. I see that it's appearing all over the place. I don't want to work someplace that is paying attention to that. Yeah. Uh, and it's so, you know, th that's... I just uh, want to show up and do my job and leave. Right? Yeah. yeah, and I don't see color. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it's, I think we've done a poor job in the past of trying to make it, trying to make it clear how complex this is. And then people go to the other side of it and say, well, we're all different in all these ways, and so we're actually all the same in being all different. Yeah. Which is not understanding that wherever I'm sitting in that identity uh, graph and, and the things that I know about and don't know about are different than the next person's, that doesn't make it all the same. No. It doesn't make it all the same. The challenges that you have walking around Eugene and, you, and walking around Springfield are not the same challenges that I have walking around Eugene, walking around Springfield. Uh, the, the kinds of things that a student who is a returning vet, who's trying to support a family, who, is, who may or may not be a person of color, who may or may not be male or female, you know, it, those complexities are going to play out in the classroom, but there are also things that as a staff member, administrator, as a faculty member, I can learn to appreciate and I can learn to factor in to conversations without saying to the person, so Clyde, you know, so Susan, what do veterans think about this? Uh, <laughs> you know, because again, we oversimplify. We reduce a person to one aspect. And when we're hiring, uh, we have to think of pay attention to all that at all parts of the continuum, even yeah. in, in crafting questions within the interview once they've made past the paper screen and then once, wow, they are hired right. supporting those innovations. Yes, and also not expecting because they're good at some aspects of this that they're good at all aspects Everything, of yeah. this. Right. You know, it, I'm continually amazed by how much there is to learn. Uh, and I shouldn't know any longer be amazed, but I'm continually amazed by, well, I thought I understood this piece, but I hadn't thought about that wrinkle, or I hadn't thought about this, or uh, somebody who comes into an environment where you're not only expected to care about this stuff, but you're expected to keep learning and where we can interrogate each other and say, you know, did you, are you, were you aware and did you know this? When I started teaching about class issues, I started uh, circulating uh, in the office 
information about the top 1% and, and this. And, you know, at first, you know, people were like, they, they'd never looked at the data before. But I hadn't looked at it either until five years before that. Yeah. Uh, not understanding the class structure is a huge de detriment when you're talking about tuition and fees that keep going up, uh, the fact that students frequently have to work two or three jobs, the fact that students don't have, uh, especially some students, don't have the ability to like rely on mom and dad because mom and dad just don't have the money or the wealth. Right. Yeah. We'll have to leave it there. Thank you for coming. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. If you like what you've seen, write to us at uh, DiversaTV, put live class at lanecc.edu, put DiversaTV in the subject line, tell a friend, and go well, stay well. Okay. Awesome. Yeah.